Uh, well, welcome everyone to this Socialist Alternative live stream forum. My name is Liz Walsh and I'll be your host tonight or today, we're the afternoon here in Melbourne. Uh, first up, I'd like to acknowledge that this forum and our organising is taking place on stolen Aboriginal land. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and recognise that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, uh, today we're discussing uh, the question of imperialism, capitalist authoritarianism, and global inequality in the time of COVID-19. Uh, we're interested in discussing the way that COVID-19, the catastrophe, has really exposed so many of the um, rotten priorities of the capitalist system, the way that it's a system run for profit, not for human need. And so in a world of so much wealth, somehow hospital after hospital after hospital does not have enough uh, personal protective equipment to, to protect uh, both the patients and the healthcare workers. We're also seeing the way that this, uh, as this pandemic unfolds, the way it really exposes the stark inequality around the globe, the inequality between nations. So. We have a situation where there's only three ventilators in the Central African Republic, four in South Sudan. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, closer to home in the Pacific, we're seeing uh, a situation where, where hospitals are using nappies as gauze to mop up blood. They just don't have enough resources thanks to the ongoing neo-colonial relationship of the Australian state. We're also seeing the way that inequality is impacting the way that people experience the, the pandemic in the industrialized Western nations. So in the US, something like 70% of all deaths in Chicago are of African-American people, despite only making up 30% of the population. We're also seeing the way that uh, powerful nations, the US, are using uh, the, uh, the disease to, uh, to further its interests. We're seeing how they're tightening sanctions, uh, really turning the screws on Venezuela, on Iran and so on. Uh, we're also seeing the intensified competition between powerful nations as they jockey for position and try and get one over their rivals in the global economy. It really exposes what a sick system we live in and how we really need to fight for a world where ordinary people come first, where human need comes first, not the profits and interests of powerful corporations uh, and the nation states that they reside in. So uh, today we have two special guests with us. We have uh, Omar Hassan, who's a member of Socialist Alternative in Melbourne. He's also the editor of our theoretical journal, The Marxist Left Review which uh, he has written quite a bit about global politics, in particular politics uh, in the Middle East from a socialist perspective. And we also have Frida Afari. Uh, Frida is an Iranian American based in Los Angeles. She's a co-founder of uh, an Alliance of Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. It's an excellent uh, Facebook page that you can uh, uh, hook up to if you want to follow some of their commentary on the crisis and broader uh, politics of the Middle East, the revolutionary upheavals, the, de the defeats um, and, and the situation today. And uh, so they'll be speaking a bit about uh, the situation both uh, in the industrialized uh, West but also uh, globally as well. I really encourage uh, I really, really want to encourage people to uh, to become a subscriber of the Marxist Left Review. Uh, it's a great way of reading more in depth about a socialist perspective on the on the world and and struggles to change it. And also, I'd like to encourage you to stay in touch with Socialist Alternative. We're hosting this live stream panel. Uh, you can do that by going to our website, redflag.org.au/get-involved. I'd also like to bring your attention to the Zoom discussions we'll be holding immediately after the panel. So if you'd like to discuss the themes that are raised today uh, a little bit more with, um, with other people in small group discussions, then uh, click on one of the links uh, in your state and then you can participate in, in the discussion. Okay, well, we might uh, start off. Uh, first up, I, I think it'd be useful to talk about how uh, the spread of COVID-19 has really highlighted the grossly unequal world that we live in and how uh, it's affected the dispossessed both in the global north and in the global south. Uh, and if you could, yes, yeah, speak a little bit more about what that looks like. Omar, maybe you could begin. Yeah, I mean, it's a really terrible and profoundly global crisis. Um, 
uh, to start with the West, I interviewed a nurse um, in New York a few weeks ago um, who's dealing with the situation there, the, the, probably the epicenter of the global crisis right now. Um, this is a, a city, the richest city in the world, um, which has been flooded with cases uh, where nurses are being forced to use garbage bags and protective equipment uh, to reuse uh, masks, which puts people in total danger. Um, we've seen in France and Italy, um, also some of the wealthiest countries on earth, hospitals overwhelmed, thousands of people dying each day. And I think we have to understand that even in, in, in these wealthier parts of the world, um, there is a profound class divide which is being made worse by the current situation. I read in Britain just in the last month or so, three million people have been pushed into poverty um, by this crisis. And so if you start with that and then you compare um, the health and welfare infrastructure uh, in places like Paris and Rome and Berlin and New York, and then you think about cities like Delhi, Johannesburg and Gaza, you can start to really get a picture of the kind of disaster um, that's coming uh, for people in the global south. A few snapshots. You look at India. India is an enormous country um, with very meager infrastructure um, to deal with this crisis. Um, you can, there's lots of migrant workers in India because there's lots of unemployment in the regional areas, so people travel hundreds of kilometres to seek work in the big cities. Now, these are some of the most oppressed and exploited people in that society. And when the government implemented social distancing measures, which we support in general, of course, they didn't think about how these measures would affect the most vulnerable, the most oppressed. And so uh, you had millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, in fact, um, walking in many cases across the country uh, to try and go home and seek shelter. There's been reports of these migrant workers being stuffed to contain, into container trucks and shipped across the country um, in an effort to supposedly keep these people safe. Um, and now as a result, um, we've seen um, scenes of migrant workers being um, doused in disinfectant like animals. And the reason for that is because our government report released just a couple of days ago has found that it's possible up to one third of all these workers could have the coronavirus. And so their return from the cities to the countryside uh, means the virus is going to spread, uh, you would think, across a country that is totally unprepared uh, to handle it. You look at Papua New Guinea, um, a country with 8 million people with 500 doctors and 1,000 hospital beds. Not ICU beds, mind you, just hospital beds. And in normal times, clinics run out of the most basic equipment, um, as Liz referenced earlier. A slightly different story in Brazil, where, like Trump, um, the Brazilian government uh, spent months um, denying um, the severity of the crisis, boasting. Uh, Bolsonaro, the president, boasted that uh, he was immune to the virus and would feel nothing even if he got it. Um, and the effect of this kind of uh, absurd and violent denialism uh, is that we're going to see a spread of the virus across a society that has been uh, ravaged by an economic downturn for many years now. Uh, reports are now coming out that indigenous communities in the Amazon uh, with very little access to healthcare are starting to be affected. And so really in the global south, um, we're seeing, um, I saw a commentator talk about Iraq and argue that people are going to have to make up their minds whether to die from coronavirus or from starvation due to unemployment. And I think this is just a terrible, terrible situation. Now, often the third world is blamed uh, for, for incompetence, for mismanagement, uh, and, and it's somehow their fault that the situation is worse there than elsewhere. But I think it's very important to understand that the reason the third world is suffering, uh, will suffer more profoundly from this crisis than, than even the West is because of um, decades and, and a century really of imperialism. You think about countries like in Iraq and Afghanistan that have been totally devastated um, by Western invasions, now having to deal with this crisis. A country like Cuba, which on its own merits has quite a reasonable healthcare system, but relies on imports for more high-end goods. But the American sanctions continue. And so just last week, a very desperately needed shipment of ventilators and other equipment from China was blocked uh, because it breached uh, the American blockade. And finally, you think about Gaza, where a siege imposed by Israel for more than a decade has left a population of more than 2 million people with just 70 intensive care beds and a few dozen ventilators. And now Gaza is an interesting story because they had a rising number of cases just a, a, more than a, a few weeks ago. Um, but since then, the cases are flatlined. And the reason for that is not because the Gazan health system has somehow uh, dealt with the situation, but because Israel has been blocking testing kits from entering 
um, that area. And so just the other day, they approved the entry of 200 testing kits, which I'm, thought, I'm sure they thought was very generous, but leaves the country at profound risk. So these are some of the, the issues that people are facing all around the world. I'm sorry, I cannot hear Liz's voice. That's because I'm muted. Huh. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it would be good um, to hear from you as an Iranian American, and no doubt have a lot of contacts with people in Iran and have been following the situation there. If you could uh, explain a bit about what's happening there. Sure, thank you. And, and thank you for um, uh, hosting this event. Um, so uh, in Iran, uh, we were all very hopeful in January of 2020 because we were seeing the continuation of the protests, uh, popular protests against the Islamic Republic. And uh, uh, what happened was that uh, in, in that same, same period, late December, early January, when the epidemic was rising in China, it was also spreading to Iran, which has a very close connection to China. But the Iranian government hid the, the actual figures um, and uh, denied the existence of the epidemic until very late in late February. And it waited until after the parliamentary elections before it announced it. And by then it was a massive epidemic in Iran. I mean, the official figures are 70,000 cases uh, uh, of, of people contracting the disease and 5,000 deaths, but the, the actual figures are far higher than that. There are uh, images published by the New York Times and the Guardian of the Iranian government burying uh, people dying from co the COVID-19 virus, burying them in mass graves. So uh, we cannot really rely on these figures. But what we do know is that while the Iranian government told the people, uh, most people to stay home, it did not close most businesses. So uh, in actual fact, the virus has been spreading more and more. Uh, it wasn't until just a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago that it, it's, it made its demands more stringent on social distancing. But, um, the, 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 the fact is that for the majority of Iran's population, which is poor and lives under the poverty line, uh, which is about at least 60% of the population, the choice, as Omar mentioned, is between hunger from not uh, working or uh, dying from the COVID-19 uh, virus. And, uh, and by work, I don't even mean anything decent that has benefits. This is, uh, uh, we're talking about the underground economy. We're talking about people selling uh, goods on the street. We're talking about uh, people collecting through garbage. Uh, uh, and of course, we're talking about uh, uh, sex work which is uh, very, very common in Iran. Uh, and a lot of women have to do it to just to survive and to feed their families. And uh, uh, in another issue that's very important about Iran is that uh, we, we have a very large population of prisoners, or at least according to the government itself, there are 240,000 prisoners. And the uh, prisons, as you know, is a place where the COVID-19 uh, virus has been spreading. So uh, because of pressure from inside and outside the country, uh, from um, humanitarian organizations and activists, uh, the government claimed that it has now released 85,000 prisoners. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But what we do know is that very few of them are political prisoners. We currently have uh, at least several hundred political prisoners who were in prison before the November 2019 and January 2020 uprising. And in addition to that, during the November 2019 uprising, at least 7,000 mostly young unemployed people uh, who had been protesting were arrested and are still in prison because they don't even have money to afford the bail. So um, 
they're all mostly still in prison. Um, and then um, the uh, issue of the sanctions is also very important. Now, I do need to clarify that uh, Iran's economic problems are mainly related to the fact that it has been involved in military interventions in the region, in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and Yemen. And, uh, and has also been involved in a, in a nuclear program, in a missile building program. So the, all of those have bankrupted the country. But on top of that, you have the US sanctions. And even though the US sanctions supposedly do not include um, the entry of, uh, do not put a ban on the entry of food and medicine, because they affect banking transactions, in, in fact, they, it's very difficult to, to uh, import food and medicine. Um, now, we also have a government that's uh, very authoritarian. So, for instance, they refuse help from uh, Doctors Without Borders, even though the, the, the ordinary citizens of Iran would welcome Doctors Without Borders to help them. So, we have both. We have the sanctions, we have an authoritarian regime, we have the militarism of the regime that's bankrupted the country. And so we have a very desperate situation. And if I may add, since I'm talking about Iran, I would also like to talk about Syria and how the COVID-19 uh, virus is affecting people in refugee camps and people in the uh, state of uh, province of Idlib, where, um, which has been under assault by the Assad regime, Russia and Iran for, uh, well, basically for the past few years, but most intensely for the past year because that's where a lot of the uh whoever had been able to escape the Assad regime uh moved to Idlib and so uh that's where the regime has concentrated on to to destroy whatever is left of the opposition and unfortunately they're also suffering from the religious fundamentalist part of the opposition that's very much in control there so they're suffering from the Assad regime, they're suffering from the religious fundamentalist part of the opposition. But what the fact is that people in Idlib are dying, people in the ref Syrians in the refugee camps at the border of, of Turkey with uh, Europe are, are dying, the disease is spreading, but there's no way for us to know how many are, are have it because they're not really testing people. And they live in squalor. They live. Uh, they don't even have water to wash their hands, uh, much less, you know, have the other requirements for preventing the spread of COVID-19. So um, that's that's another really severe um, case of the uh, epidemic that we need to be addressing. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Frida. I really agree with you in terms of highlighting the dire situation in the refugee camps and in the prisons. Uh, we had a forum last week uh, that focused on the situation for refugees and prisoners and all those who are detained right now. They're in situations where uh, if the infection takes off, it will spread like wildfire and really decimate uh, people. Also, I think it's important that you raise that the, um, when we're talking about the fault lines of global capitalism, it's not just between uh, powerful nations and uh, less powerful nations, but within the global south, there's also uh, important class divides as well. There's a ruling class who are uh, trying to uh, to impose, I guess, the um, the cost of the crisis on ordinary working class people, just as they are in the west as well. And so. Uh, so I think having that class lens is absolutely central for understanding anything about what's happening in the world. I'd like to uh, shift on actually to talk a bit about the pandemic uh, in the West, in the US in particular. Uh, we've been reading headline after headline about uh, the very uh, distressing death toll, uh, 2000 deaths in a day, uh, and that the US has now overtaken other nations in terms of, of the scale of the crisis. Could you talk a bit about the situation in the US, Frida? Certainly. Well, in the US, um, according to the Health and Human Services Secretary, he, he says that he didn't know about the severity of the epidemic in China until early January. And that's when he told Trump about it. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But even if we go by their facts, 
uh, then uh, Trump uh, uh, put a travel ban on China, which he didn't do in a humanitarian way. He did it in a in a uh, in a way to to actually provoke hatred against Chinese people. Uh, but in any case, he did put a travel ban on China, uh, and uh, uh, but he didn't do anything else, and he continued to declare a uh, the epidemic of the virus a hoax. He continued to say that it wasn't anything serious, and that's what Fox News claimed. Um, then later on in February, after he came back from his trip to India, uh, he finally made a speech about the epidemic, recognizing its seriousness, but still claiming that, uh, and actually not really recognizing its seriousness, but just acknowledging it. And uh, the Fox News was still claiming that this was a hoax. Uh, it wasn't really until uh, after the World Health Organization declared uh, the COVID-19, a pandemic on March 11, that uh, the US government declared a state of emergency on March 13. So it took from even from the time when Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Azar claimed that he learned about the seriousness of it to the time when they declared a state of emergency, it took about two and a half months. And uh, then even at that point, the stay at home orders were very patchy. It really was left up to the states to do it. So the states that were immediately facing the danger on uh, the, especially California and Washington, they moved fast. They asked people who were considered non-essential workers to stay at home or to telecommute. New York uh, uh, imposed the stay at home order a, a little later in March. Uh, New York also has a much uh, denser population, which is another reason why the uh, pandemic there has had more uh, severe consequences. The death figures in New York are uh, about uh, uh, 6,300, uh, whereas in California, because uh, the uh, social distancing measures went into effect sooner, uh, and because the population uh, is not as dense, uh, the death figures so far have uh, has been about 500. Now, uh, we also have a problem, as you mentioned, with the lack of protective gear for uh, most workers, especially essential workers, healthcare workers, grocery workers, delivery workers. Uh, uh, they don't have enough protective gear. We don't have enough ventilators. If the Trump administration had moved faster on this, if they had ordered ventilators in January, we would have had them by now. But the fact is that now, and even now, Trump kept postponing it, saying that he wasn't a shipping clerk and it was up to the states to get their own ventilators. So uh, apparently now we're not even going to get a new set of ventilators built in the U.S. until um, until August or uh, end of July, and so the states are competing with each other to buy ventilators at very exorbitant rates. They're competing with each other to buy masks, and um, uh, and then we have this uh, distinction between essential and non-essential workers, which is very problematic. For instance, construction work is considered essential, even if they're building high rises and shopping centers, but abortion is considered non-essential. So in a state like Texas or a state like Louisiana, which aim to ban abortion totally anyway, they use this as an excuse to ban the uh, abortion that was being done through the pill, uh, which, really doesn't even require much. It doesn't really require protective gear at all. But they use this question of lack of protective gear to ban abortions. Then um, we don't, we are the, we're the only advanced capitalist country without any kind of universal uh, health care. We uh, don't have paid sick leave for most employees in this country, in the richest country in the world. We don't have paid sick leave for most employees. We have a major problem uh, of homelessness in this country. 
And so the coronavirus is can easily spread or is already spreading within homeless populations in the US. We have refugee camps at the southern border uh, and we have prisons. We have the largest prison population in the US, uh, 2.3 million prisoners, larger than China, larger than Russia. And uh, that's another place where the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus is spreading. Um, do I have time to say more? Am I, am I, have I used up my time? Well, I have a few more things to say. It'd be great to hear a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, we have, uh, there are 16 million people who have applied for unemployment just in the last three weeks. Uh, food banks are running out of food. There's so many people who are now unemployed have to go to food banks and um, they are running out of food. Uh, so many people cannot pay their rent. Uh, we have uh, some efforts at strikes and uh, organizing by Uber workers, by Amazon workers, by grocery workers, because they don't have protective gear and they are uh, being pushed to the max. Uh, there were reports about meatpacking workers who are uh, being forced to work even when they're sick. And one of them, just yesterday, one of them died because she pushed herself so hard to go to work because the management forced her to go back. And so she died at the work site. Uh, we have a push by the Trump administration for people who are considered non-essential, who are now staying at home, to go back to work on May 1st. And uh, all the professionals, all the health professionals have said that if people go back to work on May 1st, if we try to have even some degree of quote unquote normalcy as of May 1st, we're going to retrogress to, uh, uh, and so, and then the, the uh, epidemic will go up again. The curve is going to up, go up again in July. So they've strongly advised against it by the, but the Trump administration, because uh, you know it, it has it shamelessly promotes uh, money and profits as more important than human lives, mm -hmm. is pushing us to go back to work on May first. There is uh, there are some efforts uh, in the U.S. by uh, leftists to uh, call for a general strike on May first. And we'll see how that goes. But uh, right. uh, there is a cooperation Jackson, a cooperative in, in Jackson, Mississippi, that has made that initiative. And we're hoping that it would gain uh, uh, support. And, um, and then finally, about the, um, the aid packages that the US Congress has passed, I just want to mention what they were. There was one. Uh, that uh, was uh, for uh, aid for the cities, uh, states, and, and local governments. Uh, there was a second one about 500 billion for uh, small businesses uh, to make their payroll for the next two months and to give some very limited sick leave to people who have the COVID-19 disease um, and to give some food aid to the unemployed. There and then the third one was a two trillion dollar uh, aid bill that included 500 billion for the small businesses, 500 billion for uh, 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 corporations, and the, the 500 billion for corporations is without any. Uh, the only requirement of the corporations is that they cannot use the money to buy their own stocks, but there's not even a requirement that they need to use the money to make their payroll. So they don't have to necessarily use it to, to pay uh, their employees. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it was supposed to be, uh, or most of the rest of it was supposed to be checks of up to $1,200 for most taxpayers. But those checks are not going to be received for another few weeks. And that's a one-time payment only. So as you can see, the aid bills in this country, they have a lot of holes in them, and they're not it, they're not nearly anywhere near what the population needs. Um, thank you, and I'm sorry that I took so long. <laughs> no, very important information there. I think uh, it really gives us a sense of the absolute barbarity of the capitalist system when you think about the trillions being given to big business 
whilst uh, we have a situation where homeless people continue to be forced to sleep in car parks. There are empty hotels in um, all throughout the US, particularly that I'm thinking of that image that circulated around the world from Las Vegas, where the hotels are empty, no one is in the casinos, but we have uh, you know, hundreds of homeless people continuing to be forced to sleep uh, rough. It really makes you, uh, me really enraged and want to commit to overthrowing this system. And if you're just uh, tuning in right now, uh, you're listening to Socialist Alternatives live stream on imperialism, capitalist authoritarianism and global inequality. And we have uh, Frida Afari from uh, the US. She's an Iranian American and a socialist. And we also have Omar Hassan, a socialist activist here in Australia. And I encourage you to get involved with Socialist Alternative. You can uh, fill out our contact sheet redflag.org.au slash get involved. Um, but maybe we should turn actually to the situation here in Australia. The, um, the pandemic hasn't been uh, uh, not nearly as, as uh, severe and serious as it is in the US, but nonetheless, a lot of the same dynamics and contradictions are very clear here as well. If you could talk a bit about that, Omar. Yeah, I mean, just like in the, the, the rest of the world, really, workers in Australia have been on the front lines of responding uh, to the pandemic and have um, done so with great bravery, but often um, criminally under-resourced in terms of protective equipment uh, and, and staffing ratios. Um, uh, we've seen in America how, how jobs on the front line, such as sanitation, um, nurses, um, you know, et cetera, uh, tend to be women, tend to be people of color. Um, these are oppressed groups whose lives are valued so much less. And similarly in Australia, workers um, in these sectors have been at great risk I know, for example, somebody who was forced to work um, as a doctor, they operated on someone with a confirmed case of COVID-19, but they, the hospital had no protective gear. And so the eight people who, who, who did this surgery were just putting themselves um, in the firing line of a disease that has no treatment. And there's been a lot of stories like that coming out of hospitals. Similarly, workers in supermarkets have been working overtime to keep things running, um, but were not given gloves or sanitizer or any of the most basic protective gear until far too late. And again, if you think about the kinds of people uh, who work these kind of jobs, they tend to be poor working class people, in particular brown, they, brown people and women. And this is a general point I think it's worth drawing out that this healthcare crisis, there's a constant refrain in the media in Australia, we're all in it together. Um, there's no such thing as red team or blue team or unions or bosses. Um, we're all, you know, it's all the same thing, but actually, um, this healthcare crisis is really shaped by our class and factors like gender and race, all of which shape people's position in society. Um, and so probably the most infuriating example of this that I've seen so far is that in New York, people are dying in their homes in the hundreds. They're not being counted. You know, thousands are dying in hospitals, public housing units. People's bodies are rotting for days because no one, is, no one goes around and checks. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs, with their HQ in Manhattan, spent $1.3 billion buying two corporate jets uh, for their executives to travel around in safety. So this is the kind of society we live in. But in terms of Australia, I just want to uh, highlight, I guess, the particular depravity and, and danger um, of the situation for refugees and Indigenous communities, both of whom are very high risk groups. So Indigenous people in Australia, um, for, for obvious reasons, 200 years of brutality and oppression, um, their life expectancy before this crisis was massively lower um, than the average Australian. The life expectancy of Aboriginal people ranks lower than most third world countries, as a matter of fact. And, and, and on top of that, um, Indigenous people in Australia suffer substantially higher rates of heart disease, diabetes, and other conditions which are essentially proxies for, for people's economic condition. Uh, they're basically poverty, diseases of poverty. Um, and so all of these factors put Indigenous people at much higher risk uh, of dying from COVID-19, which as a disease is known to affect people with those conditions much worse. And yet the government has taken zero measures to assist those communities. Any, any extra investment in healthcare or anything like that um, has not happened at all. Similarly for refugees, these are people who've traveled across the world seeking asylum. Um, they've been locked in detention centers across the country and many of them have spent five or six or seven years on offshore camps on Manus or Nauru. We still have these people in the middle of a pandemic 
sharing hotel rooms, living basically on top of one another, regularly being manhandled by guards. There is no social distancing that's possible in these detention centers or prisons for that matter. And there's been numerous reports now of there being absolutely no soap or sanitation equipment provided for people in these centers. And so it's little wonder why that you've seen in the last few weeks protests happening uh, in Villawood, in Mantra, and elsewhere, I think in Queensland as well, of these refugees taking matters into their own hands, demanding solidarity, and demanding to be free so they can have safety, uh, and you know, at the very least, the basic safety that other Australians um, have access to. And I think that's really important um, for us to understand that in every society, there are actually um, people, um, even in the West, who are suffering some of the most extreme conditions. And we have a responsibility to act in solidarity with them and to fight for their rights uh, at all times, especially uh, in this moment of pandemic. Yeah, uh, we've seen, uh, as um, Frida said, there's been strikes and protests in the US about the lack of, um, of health care and lack of um, materials to protect people from, uh, from the virus. We've also seen some uh, initial industrial action here in, in Australia uh, and some of the most impressive resistance so far has actually been mounted by refugees themselves who have been protesting their incarceration. So in Villawood Detention Centre in Sydney over the last few days there's been protests, uh, rooftop um, occupations by the detention demanding that they be free, demanding that uh, having committed no crime, that their detention should not be a life sentence where they, they could potentially be killed by the virus. Um, one of the things that Socialist Alternative has been involved in is a, uh, a protest in solidarity with refugees. Obviously, uh, it's very difficult to meet uh, in person, to, to um, have the mass of people on the streets like we're used to. But uh, this protest that we've been involved in uh, was a, a car cavalcade where we put uh, signs on our car uh, to show our solidarity with the refugees who were detained in, uh, in facilities, in particular, in this case, uh, in a hotel in Preston. They've been locked up for, for over eight months. Um, these people are people with pre-existing health conditions. That's why they were brought from Manus Island Detention Centre to Melbourne to seek medical care. And now they're very fearful about uh, what's going to happen to their lives. Um, Shamefully, the Victorian police cracked down on this protest. They quashed this protest by fining everybody who was in their cars with the signs um, adorning the cars, showing their solidarity with the refugees. Something like $43,000 in fines were given uh, to protesters. And one of the protest organizers was actually arrested at his home. Uh, his computer was seized and his mobile phone was seized. And he was held for many hours in police custody where the police refused to use uh, PPE when handling him. And he um, was obviously put in quite a lot of danger, not to mention the breach of his civil liberties. So uh, we're asking people who are on this call to, uh, to give generously, to help uh, with the legal defence. Clearly, we're going to be challenging these fines. We think protesting in the pandemic, uh, fighting for the healthcare and lives of people detained is absolutely essential activity. It's not something that is just peripheral and can be stopped and wait, and we can wait until the pandemic is over. It needs to happen now. And so we're asking our supporters to give to, um, to the fund. Uh, at the moment, there's no general fund from the campaign. So if people can give money to help with the fines uh, in the, uh, the donor box, that uh, the details should be up uh, in the chat feed. Um, and write refugee protests so we can know to allocate that money towards either paying the fines or the legal expenses in contesting them. Okay, I might um, shift now, I guess, a bit of speed to, to look at the inter-imperialist rivalry that, um, that really shapes the world that we live in, uh, in particular, the rivalry between the US and, and China. I'd like to hear uh, what you think about how um, the new Cold War really uh, intersects with this crisis. Perhaps you could go first, Frida. Sure, thank you. I think it's an extremely important question and the COVID-19 pandemic is having a very important impact on the rivalry between the US and China. Uh, first, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, when the virus uh, started spreading in Wuhan, the Chinese government did hide it. And they, uh, they actually arrested the, the brave doctor, uh, who uh, the ophthalmologist who was trying to make others aware of it. 
and they told him to confess to his quote unquote lies. And it wasn't until late January that the Chinese uh, government itself started taking serious action. And even when they did, it was in an authoritarian way, putting people under lockdown. And, and of course, uh, we, don't, we can't even trust the figures that are coming out of China about the number of deaths. I think the official figures are uh, from China are 80,000 uh, con contracted the virus and 3,300 died. And when I compare that to other countries, the figures in other countries now, it sounds so low for a country that has a population of 1.2 billion. I do, it just found, sounds unbelievable to me. Um, so, uh, but what is happening is that the uh, US government, the Trump administration is using the fact that the uh, virus started in China uh, to say that this was some kind of Chinese uh, conspiracy and uh, they're even claiming in Fox News, which is the voice of the you know, Trump administration, and it's a right-wing uh, fascist uh, network. They're claiming that this is some kind of bio, uh, biological weapon uh, that China made deliberately to attack the US. And interestingly, China is saying the same thing about the US. China is claiming that the virus was made by the US and the Iranian government is saying the same thing. And in Russia too, apparently the fake news being spread is that it was the US that made the virus. So they're all using the pandemic to attack each other. Why? Because they want to deflect attention from the internal crises in their country, from the fact that they, capitalism cannot, uh, cannot uh, help people uh, and puts uh, human uh, puts profits over human lives, and, and and not only can it not help people, that actually sacrifices people for 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 profits. So they want to deflect attention from that and from their own responsibilities. So they blame the other, but it's very dangerous at the same time because uh, what we're seeing is that even at the time when in the U.S. we're facing a pandemic, the Trump administration sounds so militaristic about China, as if it wants to start a war with China right now uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And so it's extremely important for us uh, who are socialists to uh, promote solidarity between working class struggles in the countries that we live in and, and uh, uh, working class struggles in, in China and in Hong Kong uh, and say that while we, uh, we oppose all authoritarian regimes and we oppose capitalism, that we also don't believe these lies, the fake news and the post-truths about you know, one or the other having created the virus to attack the other. But the, the, and the fact is that, uh, that apparently based on, based on studies that have been done, uh, and according to a book by Rob Wallace and into subsequent interviews uh, with him, uh, Rob w Wallace is a biologist, um, uh, that the, the virus actually uh, jumped from uh, animals to humans because of uh, agribusiness, because of the practice of big farms invading nature, invading wildlife. And that's really the cause of the, of the virus. So that's what we need to uh, be addressing. We need to be addressing the agribusiness. We need to uh, be addressing the connection between capitalism and the destruction of nature and the opening us up to these very dangerous viruses. Have you got anything else you'd like to add to that, Omar? Not, not at the moment. You're Thank fine, you. Frida. Yeah. What about you, Omar? Yeah. Um... I think we're seeing a really um, powerful moment and really potentially um, substantial shift in the, the overall structure of global capitalism and how much it shifts, it's too early to know, but um, the US enters this crisis already um, in a weakened position after its defeats in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, last year it, it had to sign a peace deal with the Taliban, which for people who are old enough will remember uh, were the devil um, and, and are very bad people. Um, and the fact that the US empire has been forced to sign a peace deal with them uh, tells you a lot about 
uh, where they're at. Um, more recently, in the last few weeks, we've seen Saudi Arabia um, confident to uh, lead a price war for oil um, designed to drive American um, oil producers out of business. Um, and generally across you know, much of the world, we've seen a growing influence of regional powers um, in, in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, and Asia. Um, and America just generally, under the leadership of Trump, has been a disaster, I think. Um, and on the other hand, we've seen China, despite um, their early cover-ups and their quite authoritarian you know, situation in, in Wuhan, they, they have been successful in curbing the virus to some extent, um, substantially more uh, than many other places. And they've also been able to scale up the production of, of masks and other protective equipment so that at the moment, China is actually at the heart of the global distribution of medical equipment. And even if, even if that doesn't last forever and China can't sustain uh, any kind of growth in the, in the broader economic meltdown that we're seeing, at the very least, they're going to be shrinking less rapidly than America. And so in the long run, um, it's a real possibility that China emerges um, substantially uh, more powerful vis-a-vis vis -vis America after this. And so that's leading a lot of people to talk about the American empire being over and comparisons with Rome and so on. But the reality is America still has a lot of things in its um, favor. For example, it has a lot of guns <laughs> and a lot of tanks and a lot of uh, uh, submarines and, and everything else. So. If you look at the American military, it still spends more on the military than the next seven countries combined. I think the statistic on the screen uh, is 650 billion or so. They've actually increased that um, thanks to it. The Democrats actually argued that should be increased. So I think the figure for last year actually ended up being $700 billion in one year. America also has um, more military bases offshore than any other country. I think it has around 800 offshore bases. Uh, China has one. Uh, and so really what um, you see is, although you have China rising, uh, America has a lot of capacity to still act pretty violently and unilaterally uh, around the world. One example of this, they've been using their military um, to just hijack stocks of masks and ventilators that are heading for other countries, and they just take it. So that happened to Berlin recently, um, and I'm sure it's gonna happen elsewhere. So the fact of um, US military power means I don't think we should predict the end of the US empire anytime soon. But this crisis is provoking large questions that um, could see um, conflicts um, that are about fundamentally reshaping the world order. I think um, it's, in, yeah, it's important to see that there's obviously enormous amount of turmoil uh, in the global economy, but also in terms of the intensification of the rivalry between major powers. Um, and as socialists in that rivalry, we don't uh, take a side. We're not in favor of Chinese authoritarian capitalism or the US authoritarian capitalism. We oppose ruling classes all around the world, uh, no matter what flag they fly under. Uh, and instead, our solidarity is with the global working class, with the global poor, with the global oppressed. Uh, we stand on their side as, as we face a common enemy, uh, a capitalist class that wants to impose the cost of this crisis onto us uh, and so that they can profit and gain as much as they possibly can. So um, I'd like to, I guess, finish up this, this uh, live stream forum by, by thinking a bit more about what an internationalist response looks like, uh, what a socialist response looks like uh, in facing this pandemic. Obviously, the whole questions of, of of, um, of borders and, and nation states have been absolutely paramount. Mount. And um, I think it'd be, it's important for us to sort of fill out what, a bit more about not just what our response is uh, in the most immediate sense, but also what kind of society we're fighting for that so much is up for grabs right now. Um, uh, we need to fight not only against capitalism, but all of the oppressions that it thrives on, all the racism, all the sexism, all the homophobia and transphobia. We need to resist all of that and fight uh, for a socialist society. So I was wondering, um, Omar, you know, if you could talk a bit about what we can demand immediately, but also a bit more about what a broader vision of socialism um, should be. Yeah, well, I think the most immediate demands are that um, all sanctions um, should be lifted on you know, all countries. Um, and that aid should be sent all around the world to the countries who need it the most. Um, and, and that includes equipment, that includes food, that includes you know, all sorts of things uh, that countries um, are in need of. 
I also think in every country, migrants and asylum seekers should be granted immediate access to all the things uh, that citizens have access to, whether that be healthcare, welfare, public housing, and so on. There should be no distinction uh, between um, uh, citizens and non-citizens in this situation. What we need is for people to be in lockdown. We need people to be isolating. That isolation has to be done in a humane and, and, and solidarity-driven manner, uh, which means providing people with the things they need to survive. Then there's the issue, um, you know, more longer term issues of, of, of debt and, and kind of imperial relations with the third world. Um, you've had decades of programs led by the IMF and the World Bank, which means that countries like Haiti are forced to import food from wealthy countries, even though they were once totally self-sufficient. We need to demand uh, reparations for these kind of countries, uh, aid with no strings attached um, to make up for the years of oppression. But more broadly, I think, um, we need to build a socialist left that's imbued uh, with genuine internationalism, which means rejecting all forms of nationalism. Um, the most important one to reject is the nationalism of your own country. So here in Australia, there's nothing worth celebrating about this country. It was founded on genocide uh, and colonialism. Uh, to this day, it continues to be brutally racist and exploitative and, and, and war hungry. Um, but it's not just our own country. It's understanding that there's no good or progressive countries uh, around the world. There's a class divide everywhere. And the only truly internationalist position is to stand with workers and the poor across the world, especially when they rise up against their ruling classes. But I think this kind of internationalist left has to understand that this crisis is fundamentally a crisis of capitalism. It's not a, a just a purely natural incident. It's a social event of epic proportions. And it makes it so clear that there is a need for a fundamentally different type of society. We need one where the resources and equipment produced by this world are distributed and organized democratically. We should not have countries bidding for access to masks, driving up the prices uh, beyond uh, many people's capacities to pay. We should not have a society where there's hospital beds empty in one part of the world while there's a flood of people um, saying, you know, dying in their homes in another. We need a society and an economy that's democratically controlled and organized across the world. And that's only a socialist society can provide that. And that's a world uh, where imperial competition does not impose itself at the moments of greatest tension. Uh, it's where all the resources of society can be driven uh, and aimed at solving our basic problems. And I think having that socialist perspective is so important, but also fighting to promote it is so important because right now in this crisis, as with all crises throughout history, there's gonna be a debate about where, what this, where this crisis came from. Some will blame China, others will blame America, others will blame migrants, other, you know, there's gonna be so many different explanations for what's happened and how we can go forward. We need to be strongly arguing that this is a crisis of capitalism and that only a socialist uh, uh, transformation can deal with these problems and prevent them emerging in the future. Uh, thanks, Omar. Um, Frida, I was wondering if you had any final comments that you'd like to add yourself or... Um, sure. Yeah, great. I would also like to talk about both immediate demands and the broader vision. And the immediate demands I'd like to enumerate are both national and international. So to begin with, universal health care um, and paid sick leave and paid leave in general for people to stay home until the, uh, uh, the pandemic is, uh, is over. And uh, no push to return to work unless we, we are absolutely essential. And in that case, with benefits, with full protective gear uh, and, uh, and uh, good working conditions. Uh, we need to redefine what essential and non-essential means. So as I said earlier that Abortion is essential, but constructing high, high rises and, and, and shopping centers is not essential. That, and I, we have the reverse in the US. We need, um, we need to prove uh, that, uh, that a working class can take initi the initiative and uh, not just working class, but citizens in general, what they can do to build protective gear and what uh, uh, workers and professionals can do to actually build ventilators at this critical moment really matters. 
because if we leave it to the governments, we're not even going to have enough ventilators until months from now. So this is a good moment for us to prove that working solidarity, working class solidarity really means something. Uh, we need uh, uh, rent moratoria. We need prison abolitionism. Uh, as, as Omar mentioned, for housing the homeless, housing the refugees. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to stop big, uh, big farms and really uh, challenge agribusiness immediately because it's destroying the environment and it's introducing new viruses into our system. Uh, I think some of the uh, proposals I was making would require that wherever we are, we start to form uh, neighborhood committees, local and national committees of citizens, including educators and healthcare uh, professionals, healthcare workers, so that we can let's we can have a say over what it means to have testing, to do tracing, to do quarantining, so that we don't leave it up to the authoritarian state to use this as an excuse to then impose further authoritarianism on us even as the pandemic, hopefully, even when the pandemic is over. Let's not leave the initiative up to the authoritarian state. It should be the citizens themselves who figure out ways to do, to coordinate the testing, the tracing, the quarantining. Citizens, I mean, in, especially, as I said, including educators and healthcare professionals. So we, are, we have people who, who really are familiar and, and knowledgeable about what to do. Um, and then as far as, and of course the sanctions, which Omar mentioned, sanctions uh, that hurt ordinary citizens uh, in Iran, in Venezuela, even though they have authoritarian regimes, uh, we're opposed to those sanctions or, or anywhere else where sanctions are hurting ordinary citizens, even if the regimes are authoritarian, we should be opposed to the sanctions. Now, as far as the broader vision is concerned, I would say, uh, yes, I would endorse what Omar said. I would add that um, we really need to go beyond the definition of socialism as only the abolition of private property, of the means of production and abolition of the market. We really need to address the fact that for so long, socialism has been reduced to state capitalism and even now, you know, market socialism. So market socialism basically keeps the capitalist mode of production, but tries to make it more democratic. No, we need to go beyond state capitalism. We need to go beyond market socialism. We need to address capitalism as a mode of production that's based on alienated labor, meaning not only that I sell my labor, or that my, the product of my labor doesn't belong to me, but that I'm also alienated from the process of my work, from other human beings, from my potential for free and conscious activity. Uh, we need to address all forms of domination, racism, sexism, heterosexism, which you also discussed, thank you. And then another uh, part of that broader vision is that our international solidarity needs to uh, clarify that we are not only opposed to uh, US imperialism, that we're also opposed to other forms of other, to other imperialist countries like China and Russia, and that we express solidarity with the um, uh, oppositions, the progressive and, and uh, left uh, oppositions in, within those countries, that we want to still build on what was achieved in the Middle East and North Africa region with the uprisings that emerged in Sudan, Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Iran in 2019. There, and let's not forget that the, the, about the, uh, the uprising in Chile, the mass protests in Hong Kong, the strikes in France, all of these happened in 2019 and suddenly we're not talking about them, but this, we should be building on, on them. Those should not be forgotten. And then, um, and then, of course, solidarity with the people who are suffering, uh, the Syrians who revolted against the Assad regime and were crushed by the regime, Russia and Iran, the uh, people who are suffering in Venezuela and Nicaragua under authoritarian regimes that call themselves socialists. We need to reach out to all of them 
You need to reach out to uh, political prisoners in China. And uh, that's what I'd like to end with, the need for a global prison abolitionist movement. Uh, prisons are an, a place where not only that COVID-19 is spreading, prisons express the future of our, our, our entire society, a carceral a authoritarian future. So it's extremely important for us to work toward a global prison abolitionist movement. And when we get to announcements, we have an announcement to make about this as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frida. And thank you, Omar, as well, for uh, your contributions in uh, discussing with us the um, all of the fault lines of global, uh, the increasing authoritarian uh, nature of the, the state, but also of the resistance that is the hope that we have uh, for transforming society, the collective action of ordinary working class people uh, and oppressed people globally. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, but I would like to make a few announcements before we, we end. First up, uh, as Frida mentioned, we have the uh, the Alliance of MENA Socialists, of Middle East and Afri North African Socialists. They have a very important forum coming up next Sunday. It's uh, from 9 till 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. So for people in Australia, that will be probably very early in the morning. Uh, but that forum will be on uh, the whole question of global prison abolitionism and uh, the need to provide solidarity to prisoners globally, uh, whether that's in the jails of Assad uh, or the jails uh, in, in Chile or in the US itself. So we'll be um, very interested to tune in to that forum hosted by the Alliance of Middle East and North African Socialists. Um, We'd also like to bring your attention to two upcoming forums that Socialist Alternative is hosting. The first one is happening tomorrow night. Uh, that is on the question of uh, the, the resistance being put up by, um, by teachers and admin, um, admin workers in our universities to the push to cut their conditions and cut their wages uh, as part of dealing with the broader crisis in the sector. Uh, we've been very disappointed to see the, the union of the, of the tertiary sector offer up uh, concessions without any fight. Uh, and our comrades have been part of the pushback by rank and file trade unionists to fight to defend wages and conditions in the crisis. Um, and so we'll be hearing from a number of trade unionists in the tertiary sector tomorrow night, uh, seven o'clock. And that live stream will be hosted on the Socialist Alternative page. And next Sunday, we'll be back at 7 p.m. And we'll be developing on that question of what socialism is. As Frida uh, talked about, it's not just a question of private versus state um, uh, ownership. It's a, a question of fighting for genuine human liberation, a society in which ordinary people truly have democratic control over the key decisions in our lives and a society which challenges all of the oppression that mars and destroys the lives of so many. Uh, so that's next Sunday. We'll be talking about uh, socialism for the crisis, what an alternative to the capitalist system could look like and how uh, we, uh, ordinary people, our own actions are central to winning that new society. Um, I'd also like to encourage you, if you're interested in, in learning more about socialism and learning more about Marxism, that uh, you can sign up to our introductory uh, discussion groups. We hold them regularly through the week. Uh, if you uh, go to the Marxism discussion groups online, uh, you can sign up and they're, they're small group discussions and a way for you to ask your question to, and to really flesh out a, a, a theoretical framework for approaching the struggles today. And finally, uh, I'd like to encourage you to join in right now with the Zoom discussions we'll be holding straight after the, um, I finish. Uh, in particular, I'd like to let you know that the Melbourne link is changed, so please refresh your screen so that you can get uh, the new Zoom link for the Melbourne discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of connecting with other rebels and socialists and left-wing people across the country. Uh, we might be isolated in our homes, but there's very important organising work for us to do uh, to organise right now in the pandemic and also to emerge as a stronger uh, radical left-wing force in this country um, uh, and globally. Um, when when the restrictions are lifted. So thank you so much, uh, Frida, and thank you, Omar, thank you. for your contributions thank today. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone who's been tuning in online as well for your contributions. Uh, we've really appreciated that. Uh, but that's all for from us. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>